The coronavirus outbreak is rapidly changing our planning and orientations as the world is trying to cope with COVID-19 and face its consequences and challenges. At the Policy Center for the New South, we gave our annual Atlantic Dialogues flagship conference a one-year rest while embracing the rapid digitalization brought forth by the pandemic to offer a virtual alternative. This year's online AD talks are digitally bringing together the AD community that is at the heart of the conference's success, growth, and sustainability. The coronavirus outbreak is rapidly changing our planning and orientations as the world is trying to cope with COVID-19 and face its consequences and challenges. At the Policy Center for the New South, we gave our annual Atlantic Dialogues flagship conference a one-year rest while embracing the rapid digitalization brought forth by the pandemic to offer a virtual alternative. This year's online AD talks are digitally bringing together the AD community that is at the heart of the conference's success, growth, and sustainability. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to this uh, talk, this discussion with three former presidents from Latin America. This translation into uh, English or whatever is your language. Entonces, vamos a hablar en español con los. So, we will continue in Spanish with the former presidents of Argentina. Costa Rica and Ecuador. We will uh, follow that order, uh, following an uh, alphabetic order of the three countries. The pandemic has been a great uh, challenge for all states and on the role uh, for the role of the governments and the freedom, our freedoms, the individual freedoms. This. Uh, and has been uh, very much discussed and has had different results uh, throughout the world. This is a totally new experience for everyone, and uh, some things have been done better than others, and we have seen different consequences, and that's why we will try to um, make the most uh, of this conversation with these three former uh, presidents, uh, uh, former professors, uh, also businessmen, about the situation that we are living through. We have Mr. Federico Ramon Puerta. He's a civil engineer and uh, a businessman in the agricultural sector. He was governor uh, from in the south of Argentina. He was an interim president of uh, the uh, Republic of Argentina in 2001. He was an ambassador to to Argentina, uh, of Argentina to Spain, and he's still very much working in politics uh, from the opposition today. We also have with us Mr. Miguel Ángel Rodríguez. He is the former president of Costa Rica. He is an economist himself, a professor, and also a businessman. He was the minister of coalition, director of the central bank, uh, an MP, and the vice president of the Costa Rica Republic, and also the secretary general of the Organization of Ibero-American Ibero States, and from Ecuador 
Toronto, we have Mr. Jamil Mawad. He's a lawyer specializing in public rights, also a professor at Harvard University. He was a mayor of Quito, the capital city of Ecuador, for two mandates running, and he was in charge of the agreement with Peru, with the mediation of Brazil. Uh, he also renewed the economy. This is a particular experience for Ecuador. He lives in Boston and he uh, lectures on ethics and uh, politics. So we have a great deal of experience concentrate, uh, concentrated uh, with them. And we will start talking about the, uh, their individual experiences and uh, the views for each of the countries. The results were very diverse and Costa Rica had... Uh, uh, as many as 40 deaths per 100,000 uh, inhabitants. This was one of the best results across the Latin American region. Uh, Ecuador had 82 deaths every 100,000 people, seventh place in Latin America, and Argentina had 94, uh, taking second place in Latin American country behind Peru. Uh, with uh, 116 deaths. Uh, here in Brazil, we have 89, and we are in fourth place. So let's start with the former president, uh, Mr. Federico Ramon Puerta. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Ramon Puerta, what's the experience in Argentina with regard to the pandemic? You should open your mic, Mr. Puerta. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. I apologize. The experience, uh, from my point of view, is an adverse one. The first thing that I was very much worried about is to hear a very hard position or statement when they said we have to choose between life or economy. We need to defend life, even at the cost of the economy. My point of view is that the economy should be at the service of life and we cannot destroy the economy because we will also lose our quality of life in the first place and also ultimately we will lose our lives too. The idea about using COVID as the only element for discussion for all measures, uh, with all measures pointing at this virus, at this bug, well, I understand that the uh, medical politics, those politics around healthcare, need to give uh, responses for different cases. Uh, for those without symptoms, for instance, uh, we have other cases of people with uh, former or current uh, conditions, health conditions, but we need to always defend uh, the economy. We need to make it successful to provide ourselves with the resources we need. We did some tests, uh, I'm referring to the so-called hard politics with uh, uh, going for life and not for the economy, then the results started to change. And at this point in time, Argentina is at a very high level in terms of deaths with not very many tests being completed. We have the certainty that if we had a higher uh, testing rate, we would have even worse, uh, worse numbers. Our economy dropped by 12%. We don't have any cases before that. There is no precedent of this. This triples the worst crisis that we lived back in 1989. All the crises from 2001 when I was the president of the Senate and I had to chair the assembly to choose uh, the president uh, to replace uh, 
former President de la Rua. Uh, everything that happened after that crisis uh, has been uh, recovered, but the worst thing is that we are getting worse uh, with regard to the number of cases, and uh, this, is happens, uh, this happens where we have the hardest policies. Whenever you have freedom for movement and less rigidity, so to speak, when it comes to seeing the COVID as a problem, then we see better results. I look at our neighbors, uh, Brazil. Lorival said that I come from the south of uh, I come from the south of Brazil, but from the north of Argentina, if you like. And when I can see that when you have the more rigidity, you have the more cases. So this is a chicken and egg thing. But I have no doubts that our policies were wrong. The policies from Argentina were wrong. And then uh, we can see the consequences which are already negative and uh, which are even worse for the future. Many people left their treatment, the uh, heart-related treatment or cancer-related treatments. They had to abandon those treatments because the whole of the healthcare system is devoted to only one thing, and that is fighting covid in my province, there are many more uh, deaths due to dengue than the COVID. And, however, the economy is totally at a stall, is completely stopped, and the individual freedom have been also slashed. Uh, most of the population cannot even move from the municipality. If uh, a mayor, uh, the mayor is ultimately the person who will decide whether they will open their borders or not. Many people could not even go visit their uh, relatives, and sometimes, uh, well, some people have been uh, have died without their family uh, being with them at all. So I think this needs uh, a thorough rethinking, and uh, we should not choose either health or the economy. We should combine both. And we need to preserve health, but we cannot just fight the virus, the COVID. However, we need to cover the whole span of activities, including ensuring health for children who have needs, for, ex for example, of a tra for a transplant. Uh, we cannot let those people die, and not to speak about those people living in a home for the elderly. They were locked in, and then we knew that we need to let them out because uh, they needed to walk around, they needed to get out to get some sunshine, some vitamins. So some people who started earlier fighting the COVID and who were looked at as heroes, they, well, became important because there is a media system that is just informing about this side of things. 90% of the time, whenever you turn on the television or the radio, you will hear how they talk about the COVID, about how the vaccine is almost there. Now in Argentina, they were, well, broadcasting live about a plane leaving the country uh, and landing in Moscow. And they said that tomorrow this plane will be coming here. This vaccine needs two doses. So this is the first one, and then another one should follow after 15 days. So we need millions of vaccines. So I believe that there is a certain fanatism, uh, and we tend to look at things and to see them either black or white. And my advice would be to be more uh, thorough, more integrated, and look at different experiences. Up until now, the policies that have destroyed the economy fail to guarantee a better state for the quality of life and the quality of their health care in this regard. This is my vision. Okay, Ramon, we will have a special round to talk about vaccines, but now 
let's move on to Costa Rica. As I said, out of these four countries represented here, including myself, uh, Brazil, Costa Rica has uh, half, uh, less than half uh, deaths per 100,000 deaths uh, inhabitants. Former President Miguel Ángel Rodríguez, how can you explain those results uh, from Costa Rica? And what was the debate like in your country about balancing uh, the things that the government should be doing to guarantee people's health and also to protect the economy and individual freedoms. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It gives me great pleasure to be part of this Atlantic Dialogue. I would like to thank the organizers and also greet the former presidents that, with whom I am sharing this talk and obviously with you, Mr. Santana. We uh, demonstrated that the healthcare system, the universal healthcare system, gives good results when it comes to healthcare per se. We were not so successful in preventing uh, the pandemic. Initially, we had a highly successful results in the early months, March, April, May. The expansion of the virus was very slow, and this allowed for the country to strengthen the intensive care units and to be better prepared to face uh, this crisis. However, later on, we would, we would fail to continue to follow with those uh, treatments. And due to the advice of the World Health Organization, we, our government followed some of the preventive uh, measures advised by them. I think we're losing Mr. Ro Mr. Rodriguez. I think we have a connection issue. Okay. Se desconectó para conectar. I think he may have logged out to be logged back in. So we will continue with Mr. Jamil Mawad as we try to recover the connection with Mr. Rodriguez. Jamil Mawad, we heard uh, with concern uh, the news uh, coming from Ecuador, particularly from Guayaquil, and we would very much like to uh, hear your description of the pandemic in Ecuador. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I think that uh, as far as Ecuador is concerned, we went through the common issues uh, to most countries in Latin America. If we were to think about a patient, not a COVID patient, but any other condition, the doctor would need a series of examinations. With the examinations, he or she would be able to do a diagnosis. And with the diagnosis, uh, he or she would imagine a prognosis. Uh, therefore, they would recommend a treatment. They would, they would provide medicine. And then they would analyze the results. So this would be the logical process to face an enemy, in quotes. In this case, the enemy would be the COVID-19, of course. And we had problems at each of those stages in uh, general, in Latin America. We had diagnosis problems because how can we make a diagnosis without examination? We did not know enough about the actual uh, condition. We didn't have important data in our countries. We could not have access to tests or to uh, analysis. We could not have a specific and updated evaluation or assessment of the situation in the country, etc. So we entered the prognosis stage, and the basic idea was we would stall the economy, we would stop and halt all activities until the moment we can control the illness, and then we will reopen and come back to normal. But this way of thinking was uh, common to many countries. Then in practice, what happened is that the economy was totally stopped, uh, very rigidly, 
and then the pandemic could not be controlled. Even today, we can't say that it is controlled. The numbers continue to increase, the numbers of new cases and also deaths due to this virus. So then we started to open our economy. We started using this traffic light system, so to speak, with red, yellow and green. And then we got to the burst, to the worst of the cases because we didn't either close completely and we didn't open completely either. So we could not get back to normal. This did not happen. We are making progress with the pandemic and our economy is not back on track yet. And yesterday, our government had to decide on a very drastic uh, close down again in case we have a new wave. I would like to clarify something. It is not that we have the solutions to this problem. The problem is that the humanity, uh, well, we, all, we are always told, go and have information and then come back and act. But here we need to learn as we are doing things. So we are taking data and information as we need to invent and uh, to do things. And this is a, a test and error thing and as has been said already there are things that work and things that don't so when it comes to treatment in latin america and in my country we find that the national healthcare systems are not strong enough they are very precarious with very few exceptions and we find that there weren't any clear policies sometimes these policies were contradictory and we also found that the public sector did not quite know what to do in order to get results. So the results are very bad. We don't have much testing. We have too many deaths with regard to the number of uh, people in the country. We have too many deaths with regard to the number of cases of infected people. And on the positive side, however, the decrease of the Equatorian economy, the central bank... Uh, says it is about 8.4% of our GDP this year. So it will be closer to the so-called developed countries than the average of Latin America, which I think will drop around 9.4% in 2020. We had a very special case in Wajakil because COVID was something that we could see and hear on the news as if something uh, was very far away and then it actually exploded in our face. And because it was like this, it brought all the difficulties of that uh, blast. The healthcare systems collapsed. Nobody was ready to, uh, for something like this. Uh, we had very uh, hard weeks and months with lots of suffering. We had to take emergency measures, but thank God uh, the city and then the whole country learned very quickly and learned properly. They learned about the things that would help uh, help us getting back to normal and not to have such a great impact. So this is a problem also related to social discipline. I like to say that when we were children, when we uh, learned how uh, Moses came with the Ten Commandments and met uh, his people who were celebrating, he learned that those who, those of us who do public policies already know, uh, and we learned this in our life first, it is much easier to write the norms and to tell others. It is easier, I said, than, uh, to write policies and communicate those than get people to comply with them. So this is the great lesson from Moses to our days. So this was made clear again. And sadly, I think there were two additional victims to all the physical victims of the COVID. One of them in such a chaotic uh, setting across the world is the truth. Sometimes you get to a point when you no longer know whether the things you hear, the things you read is correct or true, or whether it is a fake. And this is terrible when it comes to managing and ruling a society. And then the second risk is confidence. Confidence and trust among each other and the faith 
that with good uh, teamwork, we could uh, leave uh, the situation uh, quickly. So this is the context. I think this is the current context we have right now. Thank you. Thanks very much. We had problems with uh, Jamil's um, connections, but now he's back and he can tell us about the experience in Costa Rica. Mr. Rodriguez, go ahead. Apologies. We had relative success uh, when it came to curing or facing the new cases. We had uh, an initial uh, lockdown. We stopped tourism, and that's uh, very important in uh, my country because 8% of our GDP um, depends on it, and we were closed to tourism for several months. And uh, through that, we managed to better equip the intensive care units and all the equipment. But we did not have the capacity to run enough tests, and we didn't use time. So the number of uh, contagions, the contagions grew. And so far, the healthcare system is uh, functioning, it's working, but it's uh, up to its limits. Our hospitals are full, and we are uh, facing a growth in death rates, especially before the Christmas uh, celebrations. The country is currently partially closed. It is not completely closed because uh, we opened uh, partially in July this year. So the economic impact wouldn't be so big. Regarding the drop in uh, the uh, production, it's going to be 4.5% of our GDP. That's uh, below the average, the Latin American average, which is uh, above seven percent. The average uh, of uh, growth in Latin America is uh, different from ours. And I have noticed that uh, we have a uh, worst impact in our country than the rest of Latin America in employment. Our unemployment rate is uh, has more than doubled. It's uh, around 20-22%, or it was 20-22% in October. 22%. And so we already had a very high level of unemployment before the pandemic, but it was 12%. The, healthcare, the health situation is very painful. Many people have lost their dear ones, even if it's uh, less than in other places. But the economic impact is still very big, especially because of the inability uh, to respond, uh, the inability of the government Respond. We had a primary deficit of 7%, and the level of debt is uh, getting close. So it will get close to 70%, and the deficit will be slightly below 9% for the central government. That uh, places in a position where we need to have simultaneously a uh, tax consolidation measures, tough ones and difficult to uh, to take, uh, increasing taxes, managing public debt better, and that leads to social fearing, uh, because no one actually wants to pay anything. Uh, to sort out the situation, and if uh, we don't, and if we don't take any action, uh, the consequences uh, co can be dreadful. We are one of the most uh, indebted countries in Latin America, uh, along with Brazil and Argentina. And 
and uh, that's a barrier to our ability to respond. Our institutional system is uh, the, the oldest democracy in uh, Latin America, and it's now in danger. The population is uh, very unhappy with this situation. And in, like in many other Western countries where there is uh, discontent with uh, democracy, and that makes the situation even more risky. I'm confident that we will be able to tackle, successfully tackle this issue. We will be speaking with the IMF to get more credibility in the international market. And we hope uh, the measures taking, uh, taken this year will spread throughout the world uh, to the uh, to more countries because they were only for the poorest countries and we expect them to fund to other countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are we will be back uh, on the economic impact later on. Going back to the vaccine because Ramon mentioned this uh, in the case of Argentina, he said that Argentina has uh, chosen the Russian vaccine. Ramon, could you please uh, elaborate on that options? Are there other possibilities from other laboratories from other countries? How is that discussion going on in Argentina? The discussion is actually quite uh, peculiar. The first uh, agreement was uh, made with Oxford. I'd say it's the most important Argentinian company when it comes to vaccinations in an agreement with Mexico and Great Britain, we put our stakes on the Oxford vaccine, but it's not here yet. Some tests were run, and while we were doing this, the Russian vaccine came up, and it will be out and about soon. According to the government, it will be here uh, next week. There is quite a lot of criticism because Pfizer, as it did with uh, other countries, tried to uh, ask for things that were impossible to accept. And uh, those conditions, those requirements uh, have never been known. The government never stated what it was. So certain people closely related to the world of journalism and intelligence uh, said that it was uh, the complete opposite. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of transparency, and it's difficult to make decisions this way. As a politician, I am uh, monitoring and following this situation. And the sad thing is that our economy, in order to complete the information I had uh, from uh, Costa Rica and Ecuador, our economy is failing. And the result is that 50% uh, of our population is below uh, the poverty threshold. And in order to rebump certain uh, areas, certain industries such as services and tourism, that uh, creates many jobs. They require a working vaccine, a functioning one. We thought we would have it soon, before the end of the year, but it doesn't seem to be the case so far. Many people are not willing to get vaccinated because when the Russian vaccine was moving forward, President Putin stated that uh, it was not to be used with people over 65 years old of age. And 
around uh, the uh, initial idea was to vaccinate the older people. So we are, can't uh, seem to find a solution clearly. And that's uh, all I can say. Thank you very much. Here in Brazil, we were discussing on the uh, on Pfizer rem uh, demands, and we all needed to sign a document stating that Pfizer is not uh, responsible. And nor are the health uh, authorities. They're not responsible for the side effects of the vaccine because it uh, would be approved in an emergency situation. That was uh, the discussion here in Brazil. And uh, the Bolsonaro administration uh, said that that was not acceptable and others said the opposite and other authorities uh, also had their say. And uh, some people claim that it was uh, uh, reasonable due to the situation. So let's go back to Jamil Mawaz. How is the situation about the vaccine in Ecuador right now? And we can also speak about the United States because you are in Boston right now. Please remember to turn your microphone. So, excuse me, Jamil. Let me clarify something first. The Argentinian uh, government gave uh, concessions to the Oxford, Oxford vaccine and the Russian uh, one. Apparently, Pfizer had more requirements, had more uh, demands, and, and that's not... Uh, uh, has not been made public, yes. First thing I would say about Ecuador is that um, under, the current, uh, under the current situation, we will not be able to vaccinate until next year. So uh, there are still a few months ahead where the situation will not uh, change. And why is that so? Well, it is so because in the production and distribution scheme, there are priorities. I always remember uh, to see it as a sentence uh, in uh, the commentaries uh, to the wars of the Plapnes, the strong ones do what they want and the weak ones suffer what they must. And the developing countries are not on top of the list for the vaccines. It will go first for the developed countries in general terms. Secondly, it is not the vaccine itself. It is vaccination what protects the population. So we need to choose a vaccine. And I don't know anything about that issue, so I will not uh, give any opinion. But uh, once a vaccine is bought, it needs to be transported, stored, distributed, and um, you need monitoring. You need a network of uh, public, uh, a public healthcare system, even if uh, there is a private uh, partnership that needs to function properly. And what well, everyone is saying uh, this, that the transportation of the conditions to store it, that it needs to be stored in a, in a cold place, such as Pfizer, I think. It needs to be uh, at a very, very low temperature. And for countries such as ours, it would take huge infrastructure just to keep that vaccine to keep its uh, effectiveness. I'm quite shocked that it has become a, a ideology war and a war on uh, geopolitics. Where are you going to buy from? From which governments? From which uh, countries? 
we try to get together with uh, friends countries and move away from the other ones and the world is uh, now more polarized than ever and now regarding the us i would say that the three m's m's in spanish m for hand mano mask mano or hands hand wash and mobility so mask masks mobility and so washing your hands seem to be very basic measures they are basic but they are key and they are helping here in the united states using a mask became a, a political a, a political issue the republicans uh, said masks and uh, president trump said no masks he didn't use it he didn't uh, use it in his rallies and no one none of the uh, no one in the audience used it and that made contagion grow grow you meant republicans yeah, yeah. i said that uh, democrats wanted uh, masks to be used but not uh, republicans well, this is pretty basic. Health is very basic. After all, we are all humans. So how can we uh, turn uh, health issues into ideology? So, like Miguel Ángel said before, uh, spoke before on Cepal's uh, prospects on the uh, GDP. And that information is changing every day. That we should use uh, broader ranges because we are surprised uh, all the time as times as time goes by and several months will go by until ecuador starts uh, uh, vaccinating maybe there are new providers we don't know what's going to happen but we will need to monitor this day after day and like Ramon said before, if uh, now Argentina, there are 45 million people, and they have 300,000 uh, vaccines, that we have a huge imbalance between the population we need to vaccinate and the amount of vaccines we have. So, which are the criteria that we are going to use to choose who is going to have it first? So all this is to be discussed over the next months. That's true. Miguel Ángel, in Costa Rica, have you uh, reached uh, to agreement with uh, laboratories on how is this thing going in Costa Rica? Costa Rica is a very small country. The government has uh, made uh, agreements with uh, Pfizer um, of uh, two doses for 1.5 million people. And we should be getting them in the first quarter of 2021. So the country is being equipped with the uh, cold facilities necessary. And we have already set our priorities on uh, how to use it. There is priority for people in elderly homes and people working in homes as well, because that's where most of the deaths uh, have happened. And then uh, to people over 58 and other younger people who have uh, other risks and uh, situations. Also in the first group, there is the uh, healthcare staff, all the health workers. We have 0 0.5, 0 0.5 million uh, with uh, Oxford, and we hope to approve it uh, soon, in, um, in the first weeks of uh, 2021. And then, with the WHO and the COVIX program, 
we have uh, uh, we should have vaccines for one million people so that should cover about 60 percent of the population it would come in different stages and that's how we are going to move on Eso hace que los, lo que nos hablaba Yamil de, de las tres M's va a ser algo... Like, uh, Yamil mentioned the three M's, and that's something that we will need to uh, keep on during the next months. The population is uh, growing more and more tires of uh, lockdown, social isolation, social distancing, uh, mobility, uh, masks, washing their hands all the time. And this can produce uh, very positive effects. And washing your hands is going to uh, help us get rid of many other uh, problems in Latin America, as it happened in the past. When with other diseases, we ask people to wash their hands uh, more frequently. But like you said before, people are growing tired of these measures. So we need to uh, be very careful with the ideology that's making uh, some people uh, opt not to uh, take these measures. Fake news are uh, passing on the information that there are risks that we know uh, don't exist. And this is being widespread through social media. And so people will, will decide not to vaccinate. And so the contagion will not reduce as fast as expected. Costa Rica is going to reinforce the social isolation uh, measures and the reduction of mobility over the next uh, days. And unfortunately, next year, we will have to live with uh, quite a negative impact of the pandemic. Thank you, Miguel Angel. Well, Costa Rica has some 5 million people, so that's why the figure that you mentioned uh, going down to those uh, aged under, 18, under 16 who will not have the vaccine. Let me remind everyone that you can send your questions to the speakers through the uh, YouTube, uh, Windows and Facebook chat. And we have already got some questions, one that is related to the topic that we will now cover, and that's the impact on the healthcare, the public healthcare systems, because in Latin America, in generally, we have uh, uh, what we call universe, universal healthcare systems, uh, and uh, which generally cover everyone, and those who cover, who have uh, the more resources, end up uh, having private uh, healthcare insurances. Uh, and then the issue of the political impact alongside the question of, well, the ideology related question of whether we should have more investment, more public investment on health. There is uh, some specialists already saying that the response from the Latin American government was not adequate. And therefore, together with the socioeconomic uh, issues in Latin America that led to many people having to go outside to work as they do not receive any support from the governments. They therefore exposed themselves to the virus and therefore we had a large number of uh, deaths. And then the specialists also say that the vaccination will not be enough to resolve the pandemic due to those uh, loopholes in the uh, in public management and public governance. So starting with you, Mr. Federico Ramon, how do you see that issue of the public uh, funding and public healthcare systems. There was an important change in the government in Argentina 
uh, going from a liberal uh, president to a uh, left-wing government. What's the situation in Argentina? Well, the impact with regard to the measures taken in March with the very harsh measures of the government of Mr. Fernandez left Mr. Fernandez's popularity to drop over 80 percentage points back in March. Today, it is not even 40. So there was a, a drop as the measures uh, failed as the economy was uh, destructed uh, to defend life. Obviously, the adverse results in employment and around inflation are closely related to the huge expense in a public healthcare system, which was only dedicated or devoted to the so-called pandemic. So the discussion is around the percentage of deaths, the death rate, in comparison with the so-called Spanish influenza. So what happens is that at the moment, Argentina's deficit is huge, poverty is on the grow, and the healthcare system only receives resources from the state and those who went to work in the private sector. I work for a Mate production company and we did not have one single case in our company. Those who worked for us did not get infected. It was only them who relied on the government, on the public health care system that actually got infected. The people who can pay for a private insurance, they do so. And the government provides some benefits to some people in the country to benefit from the health care coverage. And the whole of the private sector is 9 million. So you cannot sustain on an economy that's more and more uh, or less flexible, we have greater poverty and more subsidies. We have in a very we are in a very difficult situation. The peaks happened after the demonstrations following the death of Maradona. There were more than one million people who took to the streets back then, and these are people who were not working at all. So these are certain sectors from the society who are passionate about football uh, who decided to leave their homes to show, to express their feelings towards uh, the figure of uh, Maradona. And this shows that it is totally wrong to talk of choosing either life or the economy. We need to juggle with both things and we need to learn quickly about a new phenomenon. But at the same time, we need to know and look at the consequences. Uh, we should also have uh, better IT systems because our uh, healthcare systems are very outdated. I live in a very small town of no more than 30,000 people, and we heard that there were 500 people infected last week, when in, in fact, there were only four of them. And out of those four, I think three went without symptoms at all. So only one required medical assistance. So no deaths. However, the panic is there, and I see that many businesses are still closing down, particularly outlets, restaurants, hotels have not even reopened, and this is taking away the resources from what we call the private social works. I see we have less workers on the private sector, we have less services 
from that private sector. So the people have the resources, but the money does not provide any guarantees. So the debt goes up. Inflation is now around 40% on a year on a yearly basis. And we do not perceive this uh, high inflation. I believe this is a, a great lack of responsibility uh, to sacrifice the economy, just claiming that you are defending and protecting life. Well, you have to protect life, but you have to also protect the economy. It is not easy, but this is something we need to do as leaders, as uh, decision makers and thinkers. I believe that that harmony that the world is losing uh, a world that need, that appeared to be in agreement in many issues is now very much polarized. Our country is polarized and the results are not good. When you have to choose between black or white, between socialists or liberals, well, this is the issue. Thank you, Ramon. Jamil, in Ecuador, the pandemic sprang out at a time where the country was preparing for the uh, presidential elections, which will take place in the beginning of February. And according to the surveys, the favorite is the former president, Rafael Correa, former minister of immigration, Andres Arauz. And this would be an important uh, change despite the fact that the current president was a vice president with Mr. Rafael Correa, he changed his policies and he became more orthodox, if you like. He launched certain investigations for alleged cases of corruption. That's why Mr. Correa is now staying uh, or sought refuge in Belgium. He's also sought by police in Brazil, in other countries, as apparently he was involved in some corruption cases. This is the situation. And then with the pandemic, this made the opposition, the group from Mr. Correa, be in a stronger position. Is that correct? Is that your reading? <laughs> I was saying just now that two of the victims of this pandemic, uh, not necessarily of the pandemic, but uh, no doubt worsened by the pandemic, are the truth and confidence. And the surveys are no different. At the time being, there is a war of surveys. There are surveys for each and every one and who can define which of those uh, surveys is actually telling the truth. Even worse, with the current conditions, it is very difficult to survey. How do you choose your respondents? How do you conduct that research or that survey? How do you select the people? If we do this just by telephone, how do you know that you are choosing the representatives of the citizens correctly? So this is a black box, and there are many opinions around it. Now, obviously, the elections will take place in February, the first round. And something which I said in the last meeting of former presidents, uh, organized by IDEA is uh, this. It is possible and logical for a person or a party to lose the election in a democracy. What would be unforgettable or totally impossible is for a whole country to lose democracy in an election process. And this is what is at stake in Ecuador at the moment. I think that there are some good lessons that we can learn from these issues that we've left in recent years. First, that there is a, a public healthcare system which is absolutely necessary. All the countries have one. And in the case of Costa Rica and Uruguay, demonstrates this. Because there was a system in place, they were able to use that system to reach the population, to provide them with the necessary measures. When this uh, system is not there, 
either because it was uh, stripped down or because it was never made. And when you try to put this together amidst the storm, it is as if you start a procedure to import tanks uh, uh, for uh, firefighting when your house is already on fire. So instead of using something that you already have, you try to buy a fire engine when the house is burning. So the first message for everyone is that we need to activate a, a public healthcare system, and not only healthcare, but also education, employment, so to guarantee the population the uh, basic services. The second learning is that we need to tell apart the urgent measures to provide people with the aid they need, food, and with uh, medium-term solutions. And I think that we will talk about this later on. Thirdly, Latin America as a region did not do something correctly when it comes to the pandemic. They weren't quite right. Up until a couple of months ago, we represented around 38% of the deaths around the world at the beginning of October. This is a very high percentage if you compare it with other parts of the world and with the number of population we have. Then in that list of countries, we have the largest countries in our region. We have Brazil, we have Argentina, we have Mexico, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru. Ecuador is not one of the biggest ones, but it is there in the list. So it gives me the impression that the larger the country, the more problems they have. I'm not sure whether we can draw some conclusions from the fact that some two uh, small countries like Uruguay and Costa Rica did it quite well. This would require further analysis, but it gives me the impression that the larger countries have more problems or are more complicated. Additionally, I think we have three more certainties which are terrible as a learning process. We are poorer, we are more in debt, and we are more unequal no doubt about this. Uh, we expect that there will be 30 to 33 million people who will become poor in Latin America this year. 155 million people not attending school. The cost of uh, cutting the education chain is, cannot even be estimated. The cost can be a chronicle cost, irreversible, it is really expensive not to have an educated population. Sometimes the school is linked to good uh, school children nutrition programs. The worst thing that can happen to a poor child is for the fact, because they are poor, not to have the right food when they are growing, when the neurons are being formed, and then they will be condemned to compete in unequal grounds with the rest forever. So this mixture, this mix of education and health is always there. And sadly, this is the situation we were at. So how are we going to get out of this? I think it would be worth talking about this a little bit later on. Yes, uh, indeed. Distance education is always easier for those who have good internet connection, good equipment, IT equipment, computers, what have you. And some people can even pay for a particular or one-to-one -one tutor. Miguel Angel Rodriguez, in Costa Rica, you had elections back in 2018. And the next elections is coming up in 2021. What's the political impact on President Carlos Alborado Quesada uh, because of this pandemic? Well, sadly, President Alvarado has seen his popularity drop uh, a big deal. At the onset of the pandemic, with the early control that we managed to do, his popularity grew. President Alvarado arrived right after a government from his own party neglected a fiscal problem for four years, a problem that was present from 2009 with continued problems and with a continued growth of the debt. And then in 2018, he had to take some measures that the opposition or a small 
party of the opposition uh, supported him to launch a tax program and uh, expenditure cuts which uh, would help us resolve our tax related problems then the pandemic came and hell broke out and brought us back to a situation that was even worse than the one we had back in 2009. So the president has lost his popularity, but the opposition parties are very much fragmented. And we are seeing in Costa Rica the same things we see in Europe, in the United States, in South America, and in uh, virtually the whole of the Occident, of the Western world. We are losing uh, affection towards uh, politics and politicians. Uh, we are seeing how people are losing their trust on politicians. They are turning their backs on the governments, and this makes it possible for very populist governments to rise, who manage to convince people who a leader is a savior, uh, who has a direct connection with the people, without uh, having to resort to the rule of law institutions, but rather by breaking those institutions and uh, how they can provide uh, magical solutions, so, so to speak. This makes that uh, everything that Jamil just mentioned becomes even harder and more difficult to resolve because recovering confidence and recovering the capacity for the political party to take the right decisions when they are living times where the feelings rather than the reason are influencing on the citizens' decisions, it, it makes uh, the whole situation really complex. I think uh, the uh, outlook in Costa Rica is very much uncertain. Some of the con some of the political parties are losing their support. They are very fragmented. They are taking decisions in the Congress, such as, for example, refusing loans from international uh, financial institutions, which actually help us have uh, a, a drop in interest rates around 5%, only because the government did not submit uh, an appropriate um, agreement. So this is like a clash, a train crash, really, uh, that makes it very difficult to, uh, to solve the situation. The executive and legislative powers are seem to be playing a game, uh, going one against the other, and uh, they are really clashing constantly and this all comes at a cost of the people so the institutional system is 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 going through a testing and up until now costa rica has managed to solve its own problems by keeping democracy uh, seeking out uh, solutions uh, under a consensus trying to look for solutions and to uh, by implementing the right measures and i i am confident that we can continue to do so but of course there is a risk and maybe the elections for 2022 we might see an outsider so to speak someone who uh, without any uh, support group might manage to form a new government by convincing the people that they have a solution that neither the traditional parties or, or, or the new party that is currently ruling have the capacity to resolve. And uh, this would be absolutely negative because we would move on to a situation of a populism as we have seen in many other countries. And this could uh, make, th this could even jeopardize the rule of law in this country and even some of our human rights. I continue to remain optimistic, however, and I do think that uh, our society is small and they have shown that they are capable of coming together. And I hope this will prevail in future and that we will see our country moving towards a convention and agreement with the fund and by having cheaper credits and loans to help us grow without entering in a situation where nobody wants to be uh, having difficulties meeting those payments, for instance. Okay, so we have different questions on the vaccina vaccination. And there are certain considerations, for instance, on the allowance from the uh, 
president of Brazil, Mr. Bolsonaro, uh, when he said that vaccination will not take place in the country, he said that he will not take it, uh, for one. And I believe that here in Brazil, there was a survey back in August, and we saw that only 9% of Brazilian people said that they would not take the vaccine against COVID. And now in December, that figure went up to 22%, which is totally new for a country like Brazil with a vaccination tradition that's really strong, very deep and well rooted. But 22%, almost one quarter, is about the world average. About one fourth of the population says they will not take the vaccine against the COVID. We also have questions on the logistical difficulty when it comes to keeping those vaccines at such low uh, temperature, such as uh, that uh, of Pfizer, minus 70 degrees, Moderna, uh, we're talking about minus 20 degrees. So the logistical difficulties around it is also important. The politicization of uh, the election or the choice of the vaccine, there are vaccines for all the different ideologies. Here in Brazil, there was a fight between President Bolsonaro and the governor of Sao Paulo, where I live, uh, who uh, bought the Chinese vaccine, whilst Mr. Bolsonaro says that this is a communist vaccine, and then the federal government prefers the vaccine of uh, AstraZeneca. Uh, so it is a, a real fight uh, and a real battle related to the elections uh, uh, that will take place in two years' time. We have the governor of Sao Paulo as a potential uh, uh, president in future. Ramon, uh, I think you're testing uh, with the Russian vaccine. There are some suspicions and debates on the conditions and documents to sign. Uh, what's that question? What's that issue like in uh, Argentina with regard to vaccines? Well, here we have 25% of the population claiming that they will not uh, get vaccinated. It should be optional, not compulsory, because more people will be happy with that, with that as an option. The problem is with the Russian vaccine mainly. There is also a Chinese vaccine, and it is not much more prestigious than the Russian one, but the Russian is uh, damaged by or challenged by all these unfortunate events that happened in the past. So let's see what happens when it uh, finally lands here. I think that the cold uh, storage system is guaranteed by the food industry and the fishing industry and also other um, areas that can help us guarantee the um, uh, temperatures, minus 70% and minus 70 degrees is uh, quite a lot and the others are a little bit easier, but uh, we will manage to cater for that. And uh, there should be no problems in the cities. Let's see what happens with uh, very small populations, but in those places the uh, disease hardly exists. Thank you. Thank, uh, what explanation or the Russian vaccine is that they hadn't finished uh, phase three of uh, the testing before uh, when it was approved. So they started vaccinating the population before finishing the tests. And then they announced 95% uh, uh, efficiency to be up there with uh, Pfizer and Moderna. But uh, the documents have not been submitted or published on uh, the documents on how they got to that uh, high percentage. So this is why there are doubts uh, concerning the efficiency of the Russian vaccine. Jamil Mawad, is there skepticism uh, regarding uh, the vaccine and uh, the, the government or the state's uh, ability to face a critical situations uh, such as this one, uh, both in Ecuador or uh, 
the United States. Sí, lo Yo no creo que eso vaya a desaparecer. Well, I don't think that's going to disappear. Um, quite surprised and shocked with all the conspiracy theories going on around in social media on anything and uh, written by anyone. There is a certain amount of uh, skepticism that makes sense. People don't want to have good any uh, side effects and they wanted to last for a certain amount of time and so and, and that makes sense but uh, not relying on it uh, beyond the methodic doubt like Descartes used to say it does not make any sense where the social contract that allows us to work as a society the problem with conspiracy theory the serious problem is that so uh, all you need to do is to utter them. It suffices with one person uh, throwing it out there. You don't need to prove anything. You say it and everyone starts having doubts. And uh, scientific research is read just uh, like any other rubbish. That's the world we live in. I believe that there are two tasks we have to do. We have two duties, along with uh, our colleagues, uh, presidents and uh, former presidents in Latin America. We need to come up with a new global agenda. How are we going to come out of this? And where will we be heading? No one knows, but oh, is there someone thinking about that, or we are just uh, reacting to things as they come up? We should not neglect this. In the recent past of Latin America, we used to have our own thinking. We managed to create institutions and ways of thinking that gave us an identity and gave us uh, uh, steps forward. We should go back to this, but unfortunately, there is uh, uh, the ideology, uh, ideologies are polarized. And it's uh, making it difficult to cooperate. The cooperation is being sacrificed in the altar of ideas. We need a new paradigm. Social contract will not be useful after the pandemic. We need to redistribute uh, wealth. And I know many people don't like to hear it, but uh, so much money in so little hands, even during the pandemic, with so many people suffering, has to be tackled as a societal problem. I'm not saying that we need to uh, impose things, but I'm not saying either that we have to hide important problems to the world. And the other issue, that uh, came up in the last part of the, of the discussion is uh, how can we balance individual liberties and social responsibility? I have a right to choose whether I want to be vaccinated, of course. But if a smallpox has been eradicated or polio, and a family decides that they will not have their children vaccinated against them. And then the child goes to school and that child is contagious and he contagious others. Where is the limit between uh, individual freedom and social responsibility? We need to balance this at all times. And the last thing I wanted to say, and it's a deep thought on human nature, and it's quite funny, actually. There is an Italian author, Indra Mortanelli, who wrote on history of Rome and Greece uh, in a very light, subtle, and um, funny way. And there is this story, a great general from Athens to protect the population from the enemy's attack did what people used to do back then. He locked people in inside the city, inside the city walls, and uh, shut the doors. The population had food and water, 
arms, the walls were not uh, well impossible to destroy. So everyone praised him and admired his vision, his intelligence, and so on. But suddenly, the unthinkable happened. Precisely, the um, pest came into the city. The plague came into the city. And what was a good dis uh, decision to uh, protect the population from the outside danger became a trap. People started dying, and the, popula and the population, so to speak, instead of trying to find the virus, tried to find the culprit. And they found that the culprit was the lead, was the leader that came up with the idea to shut the, shut the city. And that person, that leader, was heavily punished. And that can happen in our countries right now. Instead of looking out for the cause of the problem, the root of the problem, we might start trying to we might start trying to find culprits. And instead of using the scientific method, we can have just opinions and polls. And it's very unfortunate, but that's the world we live in. In Costa Rica, uh, moral discussions uh, were very important uh, for the 2018 elections. Uh, Fabricio Alvarado, an employer, an evangelist, was, was against uh, same-sex marriage. And he was defeated. Same thing with vaccination. That's also part of uh, the same discussion. You have a more conservative view of uh, politics, a uh, more individualistic uh, approach versus a more collective approach. Well, too far. People are not very much against uh, vaccine. And this is precisely because there is a, a long history of vaccination in the country since uh, 1950. Since we got the uh, vaccine against uh, measles, uh, and it was very successful. So we have uh, universal vaccination, and we have, like I said, a long history of vaccination. Of course, there is uh, very small groups uh, opposed to that. But so far, we're not there yet. And I'm saying yet, because uh, it is not that fake news and that nonsense. There's it's not that uh, fake news spread just like the truth. No, that's not true. They spread much faster and they go much deeper because strange, incredible, and simple things are much more easier to spread than a serious document. And unfortunately, all the data says that uh, lies, and false things, and uh, conspiracy theories spread much faster. So we're not immune. We don't have a vaccine against fake news and uh, nonsense. And I'm afraid that next year we will have uh, some important discussion on that uh, issue. We haven't had it yet, but I expect it to happen and it will make the situation even more difficult. Like Jamil uh, said, and also Ramon, I think that the big problem and Latin America is not very different from the rest of the Western world. We need a great restart after the pandemic. And we can't go back to the old normal. We can't go back to a system where we don't face inequality. Like according to the World Bank uh, measuring the impact of uh, not of, of homeschooling and uh, staying home is that we have lost knowledge. We've lost uh, half a year's worth knowledge. 
and those people will lose 6% of their income during their working lives. And that's uh, appalling, uh, like you said. The impact is much uh, stronger on people, um, on the more destitute. In Costa Rica, the uh, cell phone uh, penetration is quite uh, important, but 40% of the population cannot have access to a good or a proper online education. They use their phones uh, for that, and 40% of the 10% uh, of the population did not have access at all. So there is a huge loss of knowledge. There is a huge loss of uh, ability to product uh, to produce, and it's a loss of opportunities. And that's this important thing. In our world, we have stopped talking about the needs and the urge to reduce poverty. We we discuss about many things, but we do not speak about the huge amount of poor people in Latin America. We managed to reduce that amount a lot in the last century, but we are 15 years back in time. We have lost that progress. So that restarts is... Um, uh, should mean going back to a new normal, not to the old one. And that forces us to uh, recover the values we have, democracy, freedom, human rights. Let's not hear people coming with lies, with the magic flus. That does not exist. That only leads to failure. That only leads to... Uh, Losing the ability to move forward. Human beings can work together with trial and error to find the best solutions and move forward, reducing poverty, improving the income of the middle classes, trusting each other, and creating social cohesion. We need to keep our values. And at the same time, we need to find creative solutions on how to use the new knowledge, the new technology to leap forward and catch up with the developed world, to satisfy or to live up with the, or meet uh, the needs of our people. So we have to take that leap forward with the new technology, with the new ways of uh, productions, with a new efficiency. And it sounds really boring. People uh, are not attracted by that. People do not want to mobilize and manifest out there on the street, but it's necessary. And Latin America must take a step forward and show the way for the whole, for the rest of the developing world. All right, thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, all three uh, ex, uh, former presidents for sharing their expertise and the knowledge in such a uh, strange situation. And uh, I'm going to switch to English now, but please stay, remain connected. Of making the last session of this year's Atlantic uh, Dialogues, and this is uh, the, the closing uh, session, and we will have now the, um, the closing remarks uh, from uh, the president of the Policy Center for the New South, Karim El Ainawi. Dr. Karim, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good evening, good morning, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you uh, today. After two months of exchanges and dialogue and uh, intense discussions, 
uh, in a very difficult context for many countries around the world. Uh, just a few statistics to start with. Um, there were about 17 uh, webinars organized this, throughout these two months. Uh, we had more than 80 speakers, and in particular, there are distinguished uh, speakers from Latin America, whom I said hello, I say hello uh, at this uh, last uh, panel, which is becoming a tradition, and we're very proud of it. Uh, 40 nationalities represented more than 25,000 viewers of the various uh, webinars we've uh, organized. Um, just I would like to share with you a sort of uh, hot at a short term assessment of what we gather out of these uh, discussions. I think the first conclusion is that dialogue matters. And I think it's very important as think tanks. Um, it is a public good that we're providing to the community, uh, a space uh, to, for us to keep on continuing changing uh, with the values, the values that, are that are ours, the values of the Atlantic community, uh, the wider Atlantic community, um, tolerance, uh, respect for facts, respect for science, empirical analysis, uh, respect for each other's and curiosity for other cultures uh, and being able to uh, continue to discuss uh, despite uh, tensions, uh, disagreements here and there. So this is what we've achieved with the Atlantic Dialogue after ninth edition, this one being online, is really a common culture and I can tell you how proud we are at the Policy Center for the New South. Uh, for your contributions, your generosity, uh, uh, your openness, your willingness to contribute to these discussions, uh, which is invaluable. So thank you to all of you, speakers in particular, uh, friends of the Atlantic community that we've created, uh, and also viewers, uh, uh, audiences that are interested in what uh, we, uh, we are doing. Um, of course, in terms of the content and of the discussions, uh, they reveal uh, our difficult times, our frustrations, uh, our hopes as well, uh, and also the fact, just to summarize very quickly, the fact that we are at a critical juncture. And this is a perception, this is an impression that I have gathered uh, watching uh, the various webinars over this uh, past two months and also this uh, presidential panel. A critical juncture which is a crossroad in a way. Uh, our choices uh, as a community, uh, uh, as a global community in fact, uh, beyond the Atlantic of course, will affect the future. And there is one, we owe it to the next generations, uh, which is climate change. We, ha we have to be more serious about the climate, and I think this crisis, when the world almost stopped, showed us the recovery, the potential of the, our planet to recover. And I think this is something essential. It was, a <coughs> it was um, one of the main message that was conveyed by the Atlantic Dialogue Emerging Leader Community, which are, are, has participated uh, intensively to, to these debates. Uh, also, the, the, val the importance of global governance, the importance of the capacity to continue to discuss uh, at the highest level of governments around the world is something that is essential. Uh, dealing with this virus is, of course, nobody can do it within its own internal frontiers. This is something that requires Solidarity, so solidarity at the global level was an, um, another important message that was conveyed by all the participants of the Atlantic Dialogue community. Uh, solidarity is within borders, a robust internal front in nations being, s being you know, helpful to each other. Uh, and I think Morocco and uh, you know, uh, with His Majesty the King has shown a very strong response here in Morocco and very strong solidarity. Morocco has been able to raise more than three percentage points of GDP in a solidarity fund uh, to help the most, <coughs> the most uh, 
people we needed the most here uh, in Morocco. And I think it's important to, uh, to acknowledge, and many other countries have also uh, been showing uh, uh, so solidarity. Um, another point I wanted to share with you uh, is, of course, that at this critical juncture, there is also uh, legitimate questions by populations, and particularly uh, middle class in advanced economies that has been sort of affected by by the nexus between globalization and trade and inequality and populism. This is an important issue uh, that is affecting also uh, the relation of different parts of the world and particularly the advanced world with the South. Uh, and as you know, at the Policy Center, we are committed to the Global South, committed, of course, to a dialogue and within the values we share, again, tolerance, with our friends in the advanced economy, in the northern side of the Atlantic community. But we, it is important that uh, we don't mix issues such as, issues such as the, uh, the, the impact of globalization on equality or on, 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 on the labor market in this country that could potentially affect the relations with the uh, southern part of the, of the, of the Atlantic. So, uh, and I think these issues can be solved through, uh, through dialogue. We understand very clearly they are, they are very important uh, internal issues and political issues within these countries, such as migration in terms of uh, Africa and Europe. But this is important. We go beyond that and we keep uh, open the channels of dialogues again to solve these issues. Uh, the last point is also um, listening to the debates. It's also the demand for protections from for protection from population. The demand to reduce the uncertainty through public policy is a fundamental issue as well. This crisis has shown that the risk management, the capacity of states to provide uh, safety, to provide saf social safety nets to their population, to provide protection, to provide the needed uh, cures, the, and now the vaccine, is something that is fundamental. So. We have also uh, heard here and there the notion that the state is back, the return of the state. Uh, this is an I, I think this is something that will, uh, will be at the forefront of the policy agenda in many countries in the years to come. And this is something we are working on at, uh, at the Policy Center. Uh, I don't want it to be too long, so let me uh, again thank all the community, all the speakers, uh, all the audiences around the world, uh, 160 uh, nationalities uh, have been watching uh, the Atlantic Dialogue, at least for a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, but let me thank also the staff, uh, uh, the team here at the Policy Center that has done a remarkable work being able to uh, organize uh, such an event, managing across uh, time zones and also the difficulty of technology and uh, all the uh, logistical issues, but also uh, the quality of their input in terms of uh, the content of the agenda. Uh, and thanks you to you too, uh, uh, the Atlantic Dialogue community, for being uh, uh, you know, solidar in solidarity with us and being uh, committed uh, to this uh, community. I hope that next year we can uh, see each other, touch each other. As you know, in Morocco, we like to kiss and we like to touch. Uh, I think this is also the case in, uh, uh, in South America. Uh, to see you, uh, inshallah, here in Morocco for the 10th edition of uh, uh, the Atlantic Dialogue, that would be for us uh, a great pleasure, like always. In the meantime, we will be publishing the annual report on the Atlantic, called the Atlantic Current. It's coming up early January and we'll continue the dialogue, of course, uh, all year long uh, uh, in the on this topic of the, uh, of the wider Atlantic, which is something that is dear uh, at the center of uh, what we do at the Policy Center, among other topics we cover. Let me uh, wish you a uh, happy new year, happy holidays, stay safe, uh, and looking forward to seeing you uh, next year. And, uh, Again, my big thanks to our former president to be, uh, uh, to have committed and to be with us uh, at the closing of uh, the Atlantic Dialogue. Thank you.